Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for Wild Seed Project's uh, first big public question and answer session. Today's topic is going to be uh, all about native shrubs uh, for Northeast landscapes. And I'm really thrilled to have Heather McCargo and Emily Baisden joining us here today. My name is Andrea Berry, and I'm the executive director of Wild Seed Project. Um, and I'm going to start off today with a uh, a brief land acknowledgement. We'll then um, go from there and jump into some information that um, both Heather and Emily would like to share based on the questions that were submitted beforehand, uh, before this session. And then we'll have ample time for your questions um, and, and answers. Um, so feel free as you're listening um, right now and as we're going through today's session to enter your questions into either the question and answer box or into the chat. I'll be here and monitoring um, and be able to bring up uh, the different topics that you all are interested in to Heather and Emily. But thanks for joining us and I'm just gonna start us off reading. So as we begin this program that will engage us in asking questions about plants and place, we want to recognize that the land that we are leading this program from, that we here at Wild Seed Project are tied to in so many ways, is the ancestral Wabanaki territory we now call Maine. We recognize the inherent sovereignty of the tribes of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn, the Abenaki, Holton Band of Maliseet Indians, Mi'kmaq Nation, Penobscot Nation, and Passamaquoddy Tribe, and honor the, and respect their relationships to the plants, animals, and other beings that have been threatened and displaced through settler colonialism. The purpose of this acknowledgement is to allow this knowledge to shape our work. Our work is dependent on understanding and reckoning with the historical and present day violence of colonization. The exploitative practices of colonialism are directly responsible for the displacement of these important native plants that form the foundation of our local food webs. And from this understanding, we can ask ourselves, what does it mean to build reciprocal relationships with people, plants, fungi, soil, water, air? Re-establishing resilient ecosystems in which all forms of life can thrive is an important action in deconstructing our colonial legacy. We also want to recognize that while we are answering these questions and sharing these resources, these skills and information did not start, nor will it end with us. We're sharing this guidance and knowledge from so many teachers, acquired both in reciprocal and extractive ways. And we recognize the gifts of this knowledge and hope that you all will continue to share these learnings outside of this hour that we have together. Thank you. Um, I am now very excited to introduce to you the teachers who will share with you their knowledge all about native shrubs for Northeast landscapes today. Uh, we have joining us Emily Baisden, who is our seed program manager. Really thrilled to have Emily with us uh, talking about the relationships between plants and the insects and other animals that rely on them. Uh, and Heather McCargo, who is the founder of Wild Seed Project, uh, here to dive into hedgerows and landscaping with native shrubs and all things in between. Uh, so thank you both for joining us today uh, for this exciting hour about shrubs. Um, and just as a reminder to folks that first we're going to go through some of the questions that were sent in ahead of time uh, and Heather and Emily will will address those. And then we're going to open it up for answers to your questions. Um, so please use either the question and answer box or the chat to share those questions. I'll be able to see them and I'll raise them up for Heather and Emily as we go through. Uh, so, all right. Thanks so much. And I'll, I'll let the two of you take it away. Thanks, Andrea. Um, I think we decided I would go first. Um, Sounds like we had quite a few questions about uh, how to use shrubs for birds, wildlife, and habitat. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully it works. I have a few few slides just to, oh, we have to enable uh, screen sharing. I can just talk about stuff if the screen sharing is not going to work. 
There we go. You should be able now. Yeah. It's here. Righty. Everyone see that all right? Yes. So all of all of the artwork for our guide um, was from the incredible Lynn Snow. Um, so I use a lot of it in this little little mini presentation here um, about shrubs for birds and other wildlife. Um, the really big important things for planting when you're thinking about habitat or wildlife supporting um, that shrubs can provide are food, shelter, and nesting areas. Um, and we want to really think seasonally about that up here in Maine and the Northeast. Um, we have some pretty major seasons that go through and several of our birds are migratory, but others also spend the entire year here. And it's important to think about um, their life cycles and the life cycles of the, the other animals they interact with to effectively plant for wildlife um, and support them in the ways that they really need most. And just like humans, if you know of the Maslow hierarchy of needs, they really need these basic things to be able to go beyond that and thrive um, and expand their, their populations. So first, I'm going to talk a little bit about pollinators. Um, they're kind of the, for lack of better term, buzz animal these days. Um, our pollinators are really disappearing rapidly, and a lot of that is due to habitat loss and fragmentation. So when you want to plant for pollinators, you want to think about providing nectar sources. And that means um, thinking about a nice diversity, things that are blooming um, throughout all of the growing season. So that means multiple species, species that will bloom early, like early azaleas, um, and species that will bloom later, like witch hazels, um, but also thinking about things in terms of flower shape. So different insects have different mouth parts. Um, some of them are long and tubular, like these butterfly, uh, these moths or the hummingbird clear wing moths. Um, and there's a lot of long tongued bees that like um, certain shaped flowers. So it's important to do a nice mix of flower shapes as well as flowering times for um, to support those pollinators. Um, and it's not just nectar. They also require pollen. Pollen is super high in protein. So it's, it's necessary for um, reproducing insects. Bees especially feed their young pollen. Um, pollen actually has more protein than uh, beef. So it, it's really a huge source of protein for these uh, insects and it's super important. And just like with nectar sources, having different shapes of flowers and understanding how those pollinator um, interactions work with the plants is really important for uh, getting different types of species involved. So things like bumblebees on this blueberry plant, um, bumblebees do what's called buzz pollination. So they're able to hold on to cup shaped flowers like that and shake them to get that pollen out onto their bodies. Um, not a lot of other bees do that. Honeybees certainly don't do that. So it allows them to pollinate really specific flowers that have evolved to only use buzz pollination as their pollination technique. So that plant won't be able to reproduce without an insect that can do that buzz pollination. So thinking about that sort of thing is really important when you're thinking about um, what plants you're going to source and having a nice mix of open pollinated plants. So that's like umbels type plants like elderberries and things like that, that really any pollinator can sit on top of and get access to that nectar. And then also these tubular or bell-shaped flowers for the more specialist insects. So the other thing I talked about earlier was providing nesting habitat and shrubs do a really good job of also providing nesting habitat. Um, here, I believe that's a mountain maple um, providing nesting habitat for this red-eyed vireo. Red-eyed vireos like to nest in little crooks of trees in the high, higher canopy. Um, so it's important to think about the, the height of your trees. Some, some birds like to nest up high, some birds like to nest low in scrubs. Um, and it's important to look up what type of habitat they need um, for what you're gonna support. Um, but shrubs and trees are really what's providing a lot of that nesting area. And a lot of birds really do locate uh, native plants rather than non-native plants for their nesting habitats.
And then one of the huge, really important things that shrubs provide is this understory shelter. And they can provide year round shelter. Um, unfortunately, at least in the Northeast, our understory has, has rapidly disappeared through invasive species, um, deer populations that have really exploded and eaten so much of our understory um, that the shrubs that just aren't there anymore. Um, a lot of forestry has made a lot of shrubs disappear or lack of forestry. Forest thinning hasn't really been occurring in a lot of places. So trees outcompete these shrubs. Um, and the shrubs can really provide quite a bit of year round um, protection. Things like this, what this little brown bat I believe is hiding in is the um, rhododendron maxima. It's our native um, rhododendron. It's evergreen, so having a nice mix of evergreen shrubs um, like inkberries, junipers, and rhododendrons can provide that winter protection. Um, and then for lower, smaller shrubs, things like bush honeysuckle and clethra, um, there's just any number of shrubs can provide really important shelter depending on um, the time of year and um, the shape of the plant. So those are important things to think about. But then the things that really get people most exciting, excited is feeding birds and other wildlife. Um, native fruit producing shrubs provide a really large amount of food for our frugivorous birds. So those are birds that eat fruit. Um, not a ton of birds eat fruit, but I'll get to that. But native shrubs provide much more than non-native shrubs. Um, one of the big arguments that I hear regularly is, well, since the birds are eating these non-native or invasive species, it must be good for them, right? That's not really the case. Um, non-native and invasive species do not produce the amount of fat or protein or nu nutritional value that these birds need. It's kind of like if we were to eat a diet only on candy, it's really might be low fat, but it's not going to give us any of the nutrients we need to think or breed or function. Um, but our native shrubs like bayberry, viburnum, spice bush, dogwoods all produce, you can tell by the chart there, um, far, far, far more nutritional content than other um, non-native or invasive species do. So there's a lot of really great fruit producing shrubs for birds and like bonus points, a lot of them also feed us. <laughs> so if you're willing to share a little bit, uh, you can find ways to produce really human edible plants and bird edible plants. Um, but just like with nectar sources, you really wanna think about having fruits that produce um, throughout all of the seasons. There's a lot of really great plants that will hold on to their fruits for, through the fall and into the winter. Things like winterberry, um, sumac, bayberry, some viburnums are all really, really great end of season fruiting plants that provide really great both shelter and fruit for things like bluebirds and waxwings and catbirds and chickadees and cardinals and robins. Just really, really great sources of food. Um, more summer fruiting plants like uh, cherries and um, amelanchier or our shads or juneberry. Um, elderberries are all really great for those summer times. Um, summertime can be an interesting time for animals, um, both pollinators and birds, for finding food. We have times of what's called nectar dearth, where things aren't blooming. So finding things that are blooming during those times and things that are fruiting during those times um, are really important. But last but certainly not least, is providing food for birds in the terms, the way of insects. So if we feed the insects, we feed the birds. Um, and native plants, several of them also provide fruit and nectar, also provide food for insects. Um, about 96% of our breeding birds raise their young on insects. Let that sink in for a minute. 96% of our breeding birds raise their young on insects. These are terrestrial birds. We're not talking aquatic species. Um, like the chickadee in this photo, up to 6,000 caterpillars were collected to raise one clutch of chickadees. That's an awful lot of caterpillars. So we need to expect that our plants can support that many caterpillars. Now, caterpillars in most insects and really all animals in the world 
are, are quite specialized. Um, it's like 90% of caterpillars are specialized to feed on certain types of plants. And that may be family, it may be genera, it may even be down to species. Um, but figuring out what supports lots of insects and what supports some cool unique insects can, can really add a lot of awe, but also a lot of really good food um, forage for, for birds. Um, a lot of viburnums. So I talked about viburnums before as cool for pollinators, cool for fruit eaters, but they also support over a hundred species of caterpillars. So they're a really great one for supporting things, um, really the full gambit of needs. Things like cherries, I talked about those as well. So prunus species support over 420 species of caterpillar. They're on one of the big ones. There's some shrub species that, that fill that role really nicely um, and don't tend to get as large, which is nice for a smaller home. Um, the amelanchier, I talked about that earlier. They provide really important early pollinator sources for birds or for insects. They provide early summer Another term for it is Juneberry, fruits for birds. They also support over 115 species of caterpillar. So they're doing a whole lot. Um, dogwoods are another great one that provide shelter. They provide food. They also support over 120 species of caterpillars. So those are some really big, useful ones. Um, I hope I didn't go too fast. I'm happy to repeat anything for anybody. Um, so like I said, just to, to finalize it all, we're talking about providing food, and that means nectar, pollen, fruit, and insects for birds through shrubs, providing shelter. So that means year-round shelter, evergreen plants, and large leafing, um, summer foliage plants, and providing nesting habitats for animals, um, which means not necessarily cutting everything back at the end of the year. Um, those shrubs, lots of them can handle some really heavy pruning and I'm sure we'll get some questions on that. Um, leaving some of that up or even leaving some of your pruned sticks just in a nice pile in your yard can help support um, overwintering bees and other things that like to nest in stick piles like that. Um, so, the last thing I just wanna talk about if we're trying to support uh, wildlife, and I think we can probably put this link in the chat, is the National Wildlife Federation um, has this native plant finder, but it is not just a native plant finder. It's also a butterfly and moth finder. And it's really a fun link that um, you can put in your zip code and put in a genus or something like that of a plant and find all of the insects in your area that feed on that plant, or at least all of the caterpillars and moths that feed on that plant. And I personally have a lot of fun with that link um, because a lot of my pet planting in my yard is to support or so that I can find really specific um, caterpillars that are host plants. Um, and it's just a fun one to play around with. So I can put that link in, in the chat um, and I'll pass it over to Heather. Thank you, Emily. That was great. So I was given the task of explaining how to create or build a hedge or hedgerow. Remembering, you know, most people think of hedges as just being single species. And in some situations, when you have a small space, you know, you, I would still consider that an okay thing to do. But whenever possible, when you can be planting more of a hedgerow, which is multiple species of shrubs, including maybe some trees, um, and then of course, herbaceous ground covers, um, you will be getting, supporting that much more biodiversity. And just since I know this, uh, this is a public Q and A, our shrub guide has lots of combinations. And then also our, tree guide that we did the first year, three years ago, and then the ground cover guide. Those all have different combinations. And then also in the chat, I believe Andrea put it in already. I've written several de very detailed articles on hedges and hedgerows. One is was through the Ecological Landscaping Alliance. And so that was oriented more towards gardening and landscaping. And then the other one, was through the main organic farmers and gardeners, and that was more oriented to big landowners, you know, such as farmers 
who are, are going to do a bigger hedgerow, not like a little, you know, some little planting around their house. So though all those tools will give you endless species combinations for different growing conditions from my favorite small shrubs for a more formal-ish, and I say ish on purpose because not too formal, hedge around a say um, patio to, you know, ones that thrive in shade or sunny dry conditions. But here we are in mid-May and I imagine some of you have plants that you've already bought or that you're intending to buy at a native plant sale this spring that you are anxious to get in the ground. You know, if you did the bare root thing, hopefully those are already in the ground. Um, but I'm imagining that most of you are now, I want to make a hedge or hedgerow on my property. How do I get started? It's mid-May. You know, can I just go dig a hole and start putting it in? Now, my favorite way to prepare a site is the smothering way, you know, with layers of cardboard and then mulch on top. If you're, if you're looking to do an area that's got invasive species, that's really your job to tackle. This growing season is pulling them out. If it's a sunny location, maybe even putting down a black plastic tarp to solarize it. But if you've got an area that um, isn't, you know, it invasive species aren't the big issue. Say it's the edge of your driveway or the edge of the, you know, the woods in your lawn or maybe um, uh, you want to divide your property from your neighbor or two you know, agricultural fields, doing the cardboard with then some kind of mulch on top. If you are a landscaper, you, know, um, you can now get this heavy duty brown paper mulch that comes in rolls. And that is really quick and easy to roll out and then put mulch on top. So what you do is choose your site. Um, and where you're going to do it, and then you need to mow the ground, mow what's ever there really close, trop, you know, cropped before you put the cardboard or paper mulch, and then mulch on top. And the mulch on top can be, you know, something free like straw or hay that you might already have. Um, you can buy um, bark mulch. You know, you can use wood chips, but they need a lot more time to degrade before you can plant a lot of things through it. If it's right near your house, you'll probably want to use some bark mulch because it looks nicer. But if it's out in a more wild area, you don't need to do that. You can, you know, use something cheaper. I also, you know, I have a very small lawn, but if I, I, um, my lawn grows too well, despite never having any fertilizer or extra water. So I often catch the grass clippings and use them as mulch on areas. So I put the cardboard down and then put the grass clippings right on it, right after I mow. Don't let it sit in the bag or it will start um, composting. That makes a nice mulch. You just have to do a little bit at a time. Um, so once you've smothered the area, then your job is really to wait you know, and it can take a minimum of three months to a year if it was really, um, you know, heavy vegetation. The other nice thing about using cardboard and mulch is you might have some existing plants in there that you want to are already there that like a tree or some native shrubs that you want to, you know, just expand around. So the cardboard and mulch won't bother them at all. So while you're waiting to smother it, that's when you can start doing your homework of figuring out what are the best species for that site. And it's it, it, it you always want to start of looking at the list for the conditions you have. So if it's sunny and dry, you're going to pick those species. If it's shady and moderately moist, those. If it's a wet area, you know, the, we've got great choices from all of those areas. And again, those are all in our different publications and in those two links um, from those two articles on hedges and hedgerows I was telling you about. Um, and the best time to plant it then would be if you if you get it successfully smothered this summer, you can do the planting in September, early October. Um, 
you know, perhaps you or Wild Seed Project members say you've sowed a bunch of seeds over the winter and they're starting to germinate now and you will have grown them through the summer. Those can be ready to plant out later in the season. Um, and, you know, the kind, it's nice, along with the woody plants, it is nice to include some herbaceous species as, you know, as ground cover. And some of my favorites for that are the different um, woodland asters and goldenrod, because remember, once things grow, it will be shady under the shrubs, even if it's in sun now. Um, the two different native anemone species are great. Violets make a great ground cover. Um, ferns, wild strawberry, heal all. Some of those plants um, that might be too aggressive in your garden, this is the perfect environment, the way to get them in your landscape. Um, um, and then, so the ideal time is to me is to plant it in the fall. Or if you didn't get the plant, you can also order bare root plants and plant them next spring and the site will be all perfectly prepared. So you'll just be able to pull back the mulch and the cardboard will probably have broken down and plant right through it next year. It Let's say you do have some plants in pots some, or you go to some plant sales and you get some native shrubs now, you could go ahead and plant them now and still do the mulch and cardboard all around them. Just make sure you remove the existing vegetation, you know, in a wide enough, probably a two foot circle, and then you can do the mulch and cardboard up next to it. Um, if you if you are planting anything this time of year, you know, the single most thing that you need to do with any um, late spring or early summer planting is make sure you water it through the summer if we have droughts. You know, that's when people lose plants, it often is just drought stress. And that doesn't mean watering it every day. This is the beauty of uh, woody plants. It means giving them heavy watering probably once a week, or you can purchase those watering bags and put it around the plants and fill it up with a hose every once in a while. Um, those are very, those work really well. Um, just looking now at some of the other maintenance. So the, the, you know, once you, once you've planted, you will have, you might need to mulch a little bit more around the shrubs that you just planted. Pruning. So people, you know, what kind of pruning do shrubs need or what kind of pruning do trees need? Well, the answer from a nature perspective is none. All our native trees and shrubs are self pruning. They do not mind having a dead branch. They know how to close off and keep infection out. So pruning is really done for us. Now, of course, if you're planting your shrubs or your hedge or hedgerow is right, you have a small yard and it's right you know, by where you walk by it all the day, you know, every day, you know, that would be the situation. You know, I, I do pruning on my woody plants that are right next to me that I see, but otherwise, you know, farther out, you do not need to remove dead stems. In fact, dead stems are hugely val valuable for all Emily's favorite insects. Um, and birds too, you know, a dead branch, you'll notice birds actually tend love to perch on a dead branch. I think they get a better view than all the vegetation around it. So the pruning, I'm not saying don't prune, just remember that's for us, not for nature. Now, a lot of the shrubs, and we've outlined this in the shrub guide, there are many, especially some of the smaller native shrubs that can range in height from one to five feet. And let's say you want your hedge to be, you know, two to three feet tall. Those you can go back and hand prune, you know, every other year, or every couple of years. You can even cut them back down to the ground and let them re-sprout. You know, some great examples of that are like the yellow bush honeysuckle, um, bayberry, you know, you can, wild rose, you can keep them shorter by doing that. What I do discourage people from doing is using shears. Um, that's brutal to the plants and it doesn't make the kind of um, 
the way the leaves grow back make it not so enticing to the wildlife to get in there. So take the time to hand prune if you feel like you want to tidy up the look of your um, hedge more. Um, the, the probably the most important long-term care of any planting, um, and it it's, can be particularly challenging in a hedge or hedgerow, is checking in for invasive species appearing in, you know, bittersweet, especially some of the, you know, a vine like bittersweet, um, where you are going to want to make sure you go in and look under there every year and see what's coming up and yank it out when it's little. You know, if you wait till it gets really big, then you're going to have a much bigger problem. So, you know, spotting for invasive species is an ongoing job that we all have to do because of the disruption we've all created. And then the other question that I saw a lot of was about pest and disease. So I'm an ecologist. Pest is a not an ecologist word. Um, and you know it's it's a reflection of agriculture and domestication where we've moved plants and animals around the world. So we do have you know insects and disease that have you know that are are not in co-evolved with our vegetation. And you know for, for them you do have to keep your eye out for them. So let's take an example of our native viburnums and the viburnum beetle which has moved around, you know, I've been doing this kind of work for, you know, 40 something years and all the different viburnums at different times have had um, been attacked by the exotic viburnum beetle. And you know what, I have left every single one of mine that has been completely defoliated and looked dead and they have all come back. Sometimes they look fine the, sec the next year, sometimes it takes multiple years, but don't yank the shrub out. If you really hate how it looks, you could cut the shrub back down to the ground, but you don't even need to do that. It will, you know, when it leaves out the next year, often it has higher, puts higher, you know, of some sort of chemical in the leaf that they, a beetle doesn't like. Um, so if you really can't stand the look of a dead shrub standing there by your door, you could cut it back down the ground and let it re-sprout. But all the, I've had, I've done this for years and none of mine have been killed by it. They might look dead that summer, but they're not. Um, disease, somebody asked the question about, you know, specifically the dogwood blight. And I think there's so that we've got two different species of dogwood. There's the Bogota dogwood, which is very abundant in Maine. That is not a drought tolerant species. And so it's also a short lived species. So sometimes it gets that yellow um, fungus and sometimes the whole tree will die. And I, it usually is after a drought. So if you have, you know, that's the situation where if it is a dry summer, you might, you know, get just dribbling the hose on some of those plants to strengthen them. And if you notice the dead twigs, um, it's usually in late winter that you start to notice it, go and prune them out. You know, I've had ones that just had some of it on it and I just prune it out and they've done fine, but it's not a drought tolerant um, um, small shrub, small tree. And then the large brack dogwood, that one, you know, even though it's a woodland understory tree, it's important to just give it um, at least, you know, a, a couple of hours of sunlight. Um, and I'm, you know, I'm on a campaign to bring back the large flowering dogwood. It's an excellent species for wildlife and it's incredibly beautiful. And you just have to cite them carefully. Um, deer resistant, that's another really tough one because we all need to get political about, you know, our, you know, how our, you know, state, you know, manages deer populations. And when the population's really high, they will eat almost anything. Plant vegetables near your favorite native plants and the deer will go for the vegetables first. Um, you know, but there are, we've listed them in the guide, which one are more resistant to deer. Um, I've also had good luck with that deer way spray that you can put on it that's just chili pepper and egg, but you have to do it regularly. But that's a really tough one. We need to instead work on not having our deer 
population so high or put netting over it. It doesn't look very good, but that works while you're helping it get established um, is another thing you can do. And choosing larger shrubs because, um, you know, like the um, some of the viburnums and shrub dogwoods, you know, they get way above the level of the deer and they might eat the lower leaves, but then you can have things like yellow bush honeysuckle and bayberry underneath them that won't get bothered. I think I hit on most things and I'm sure people have lots of questions. So I'll end there. Great. Thank you so much to both of you. Um, that was super informative um, and I think answered a whole lot of the questions um, that are coming in through the chat. Um, I am happy to, to jump in um, with a first question, um, which is around the fact that shrubs grow slowly. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering if you can suggest some shrubs that are faster growing um, and particularly the faster growing shrubs that might shrubs that might deal with shade or part shade. Okay, first of all, since I'm old, I'll be the one to talk about growing slowly. Uh, we all need, I don't think shrubs grow slowly. Many of them grow quickly. Um, and probably some of the fastest one, um, the silky dogwood is particularly fast. So is pussy willow. So purple flowering raspberries. So is our native hydrangea arborescence. Um, so is bayberry. So is yellow bush honeysuckle. Um, we have lots of great shrubs that thrive in the shade. And so I, I point you to the links in our thing because that will give you whole lists versus us taking the time to do that. We've got tons. That's my favorite topic. My specialty is plants of the woodland understory. We got tons of shrubs that do fine in the shade. Your shrubs will be healthier, just like your trees. If you don't buy big giant ones in the nursery, you know, these, these, you know, when you, when you dig some, you know, there are some exceptions to that, but when you field grow something big and then transplant it, there's a huge shock factor. It takes a couple of years to recover for many species. And then when they're grown in these giant pots for many years, they're often root bound. They've also, if they've spent a lot of time in a normal nursery, they've been fed a steady diet of chemicals and they're just not going to be, you know, rebound as well. Um, so. Great. Emily, do you want to add or? Um, I'll just add to agree with everything Heather says, uh, but also our, sh our shrub guide, the way it's set up, um, shows the conditions for each plant. So it'll say whether it's a suckering shrub, whether it's tall, whether it's short, um, and if it likes wet or if it likes shade or sun. Um, and the the kind of the nature of shrubs, like what Heather is saying, is that they're they're an understory species. So most of them can handle some shade. Um, some really only want fairly deep, deep shade. It's really um, when you're using plants to produce like food, they're gonna fruit more in sun. Uh, but that doesn't mean they can't be in the shade. Great. Um, I'm seeing a few questions about invasive shrubs. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, the two of you can talk about um, how to manage invasive shrubs and a little bit about how to make that transition from invasive shrubs to native shrubs. <laughs> A weed wrench is a really handy tool to um, pull up, pull out woody, plant, woody invasive plants um, that, you know, depending on the size of it, depends how big of a weed wrench you need to get, but it has a lot of leverage and it's a very effective tool for that. Um, you can also, you know, cut them and then, um, you know, I, I had a big burning bush in my yard here that I didn't, you know, have either the strength or the inclination to pull out. And so I actually cut it at waist level and then kept rubbing the shoots off. You can't do that if you have lots, you know, if you have lots of invasives, um, 
you know, goats, I'm a big fan of goats for that. You just have to make sure you protect, you know, where you're going to get the goats. You have to protect, I, you know, I think a great business would be a suburban shepherdess with, you know, goats and electric fencing. Um, if there, there's probably going to be a seed bank, like if, you know, with honeysuckle and buckthorn. So it's not a one-time thing. And if you have a big area, it's going to take a lot more work than a smaller area, but it's doable. Um, um, yeah, I'll just say Heather touched on this like a little while ago, but invasive species in general, your, your first and best bet is monitoring. Uh, keep an eye on them, try to get them before they take hold. Uh, once they do take hold, if it's an early invasion, you might have a chance for eradication. So you can really be pulling regularly and cutting and trying to exhaust that plant. Um, but if you're at the point of massive, massive invasion, uh, you're you're going to want to focus more on, on mitigation, on um, bringing in new species, removing sections, um, and picking your battles wisely. Um, we do have a nice little a uh, blog, I think, on the website that has some list of kind of rugged plants that could be planted after invasive species removal. Um, but I, I can think of like bush honeysuckle or flowering raspberry are both, like Heather said, pretty quick growing plants, um, and they're really good at, at spreading. Uh, so they're a good one to put in after invasive species removal. It is, it is hard and it's easy to get um, upset and feel overwhelmed with it, but it's really focusing on the small successes when you have a really bad invasion um, and clearing out little areas and then planting those pretty quickly. You wanna make sure that that if you successfully removed it in an area, you wanna plant it because otherwise it's, it's just gonna come back. Um, because like I said, if it's a big invasion, there's gonna be other, other species out there. I know in my house, um, my neighbors aren't gonna do anything with invasive species removal. So I can be, doing all I can in my yard. And they're still gonna come back from, from outside of my personal property. <laughs> um, so it's about not getting too upset about that and knowing that as you're adding your natives in, um, you're, doing, you're doing a good job. <laughs> yeah, that, that link, that's a PDF called Invasive to Natives. Um, and yes, we got plenty of you know, native plants that grow vigorously and, really will, um, once you pull the other ones out, can fill in the sp space pretty quickly. And, you know, as more and more of us add more native plants back into the landscape, the birds will be eating them and they'll be seeding in. It's that, you know, all these invasive species were widely promoted and planted on roadsides and in the nursery industry. And, you know, we get our native species back in there with those fruits and seeding around, it, it will turn the tide. And there are plenty of examples where people have successfully done it. It's harder if you're old because you, you know, the physical part, I've specialized in my yard here on, you know, tricks for older people on how to do it. So if you have a huge landowner, you're going to have to, you know, engage some strong youth or goats um, as a <laughs> job when you're. I have learned that kids really like removing invasive species. Yeah. Like one of the few times they're allowed to really destroy something um, and you can tell them to just go at it. We would do what's called what we called save a tree where they pick a tree that's getting maybe covered in bittersweet or surrounded by all sorts of sometimes it can be sh save a shrub if it's you find one nice shrub surrounded by a bunch of um autumn olive or burning bush um have kids want to save that shrub and you can really go hog wild on <laughs> on those invasive species and it, it's kind of fun <laughs> Amazing. Um, all right, I'm gonna slightly shift uh, the question, which is there's a there's a few folks who are saying in the chat and in the questions list that they have a native shrub of a variety of different species, some viburnums, um, some some other pieces or other species. 
And they're starting to want to divide them or to transplant them to other places in their yards. Um, can you talk about strategies for transplanting some smaller seedlings um, of already growing shrubs? Um, I Some shrubs can be kind of finicky to move. <laughs> a lot of them have, have set out nice roots. So getting a nice... Um, root ball with it is really important when you're digging down, kind of feel where the roots are going. And also I always take a, a look at the weather. If it's going to be cool and rainy for a few days after, those are the good times to transplant really anything. Um, otherwise, kind of go choose fall because fall you're more likely to get nice cold, cool areas. Um, and you really just like planting a new plant, you're going to want to kind of baby it for the first year or so. Make sure you're you're watering and, and not letting it dry out. I'd say we're in mid-May. I I I'm past my time that I ever dig and move stuff now. Um, and the smaller the better, not being tempted to do a big one, you know, but some of these do seed in or shrub. So learn to recognize what the seedlings are like if it's you know, some of the ones that send up suckers. Um, often it's smart to cut it, you know, way back down to the ground or quite short because just the shock of, you know, removing it um, somewhere else when it still has a stem, um, it's better to let it re-sprout. And all of, almost all of our, our native trees and shrub, you know, the conifers don't because they, um, evolved before the grazing animals. But remember, all of our native trees and shrubs, one of the reasons they sucker is they evolved with all these big megafauna who ate them all so they, they know how to sprout back. So that's where if you cut them back down to the ground, so you're moving the root system. Um, that's the only way I would do it this late in the year. You know, the time to do it in my mind is like the beginning of April, the second the ground thaws. Or like I said, you can do it in the fall too, and it's it's much less of a watering job. Um, I, I think tailing on the end of that, um, there's a few folks who've commented that they're getting their delivery of bare root shrubs um, coming up. Can you talk a little bit about um, the, you know, some general planting instructions? So first of all, do um, do we fertilize native shrubs? What kind of soil amendments should we be thinking about? Um, and then I do see a specific question about how close, you know, when we get small shrubs, they're small. And the temptation is often to put them quite close together, but we know that shrubs grow fairly large and wide. And so if you can talk about um, both, how do we help them to go into the ground um, and how do we help them not outcompete each other? So let's assume that you're not like in a sterile site in the middle of the city. You want to plant the shrub, you know, in the correct site on your land. And uh, no, don't fertilize, don't add compost in the hole. If you felt like, let's say you had a new house and the soil really was, you know, well, first of all, it was driven over by a bulldozer. You better get in there with a digging fork and loosen it down deep first, but, um, you know, you want to mulch after you plant it. And of course you want to spread the roots out and all that. And if you're just getting your bare root stuff now, definitely go out and dig your holes now before they come so that it doesn't, it's digging the hole that takes all the work, not actually putting the plant in the ground. It's loosening the soil. Um, um, but using a natural mulch, if you have leaves, that's the ideal, you know, if not, you know, get some bark mulch, preferably well-aged, um, um, but they don't need all the nutrients um, that our cultivated plants do. And there's been a lot of research done on this in the last 30 years. Just it used to be that people would fill a hole, a hole for a tree or shrub with all this good soil or compost. And then they learn that the, the roots never bother to go out. You can't plant something too close together. It, it will end up weaving with other, you know, eventually as it grows with the other plants, but a thicket is ideal for wildlife. So 
you know, if you know, you know, hopefully if you ordered those plants and you know what they're going to look like when they're a little bigger, that can help you judge how cl close together. But if you over plant it, that's okay. okay. Let it weave together or maybe you'll end up culling a few things out later. But I find that's something people get so worried about. And the, you know, in nature, what happens is things will seed in very densely. And then 200 years from now, will all those same plants be there? No, they will have, you know, worked their way out. So um, obviously you don't want to waste your money, but it's not wasting. You do it closer together. You'll get more habitat for all those critters sooner if you plant things close together. And then, but like I said, maybe you'll someday choose to thin some out. All right. I'll just say real quick, I'm glad you you mentioned the um, when you dig the hole, not adding a bunch of compost because they they have really found that the plant just ends up girdling itself. It just keeps wrapping its roots around the hole um, and it doesn't want to go into that soil. So making sure when you're digging your hole, you're saving some of your soil to put it back in. Um, bare root plants, if you think about how how they're grown, they're grown in the ground and then they tear them out of the ground and wash all the soil off. Um, so they're a little bit stressed. Um, they're all chopped back. Um, so what I do is I got my Fedco order a few weeks ago. Um, and yeah, I, I dig all my holes, I save my soil, and I do um, a nice layer of leaf mulch. Sometimes, because I'm trying to get rid of some, some lawn from my house, um, I'll add uh, cardboard around the grass first and add the leaf mulch on top of that. Um, and I find it helps a little bit. Um, also retain some, some moisture for those plants. Um, also, if you're ordering from Fedco, they come with really great instructions for what to do. All right. Um... I would love for y'all to talk a little bit about edible shrubs. So shrubs that have berries, shrubs that are fruiting, um, and, and in particular kind of then what do we do or how do we take um, shrubs that are using berries to disperse their seeds and prepare them for growing? So why don't, Emily, you want to talk first about the, the food portion of shrubs. And then Heather, if you could talk about how we process um, berries to get to the seeds. Sure. Uh, yeah, there's there's a whole bunch of shrubs that produce edible fruits, um, some tastier than others. <laughs> uh, we all know about blueberries. Blueberries are a good one. And, and I, I mentioned this earlier, if, if you're growing them for food, a little bit more sun always provides more fruit. Um, but it also often means a slightly more stressed plant. A lot of plants will flower more and fruit more in a stressed condition because they need to reproduce. They're worried they might die. Um, there's also a lot of cultivars out there. Um, I imagine we'll probably get to the cultivar conversation at some point. So I'll just start it now. <laughs> um, that are, are They've been selected for larger fruits um, and more fruit yield. But we're starting to realize that hit sometimes at the cost of flavor. <laughs> I know at least with strawberries, it's clearly become a cost of flavor. Um, and just anecdotally, I think blueberries as well. I've got some cultivars of blueberries in my yard and then also some wild ones and the wild ones taste far better, even though they produce less. Um, so that's really something to think about too, when you're, you're sourcing your plants. Um, but there's a lot of really cool plants that produce both food for animals and us. So blueberries, sumacs have some cool edible, uh, you wouldn't eat the seed part, but the little fuzzies make really great lemonade um, and they're a high source of vitamin C. Um, there's the high bush cranberries are pretty tasty. Um, the wild raisins are pretty tasty. Amelanchier, I mentioned them before, the June berry. They're actually pretty good. Some people are like iffy about them, but I like them. And I think they're they're nice because they happen before the blueberries. Um, so it's nice to have something, something fresh earlier on. Um, and then of course there's elderberries. And elderberries, you can make hedges with really easily. They'll spread quite nicely through suckering. Um, and they, they're, they're a really tasty one for jams and stuff like that, but it's really getting to know your flavors and whether or not there's something that you would need to add a bunch of sugar with to taste good or like aronia. <laughs> aronia is really easy to plant, really easy to grow. Um, birds love it. I keep hoping that I'll love it. 
<laughs> and it it really kind of dries your mouth out. So without without some sugar, it kind of loses its uh, luster. <laughs> So you mean for propagating, Andrea. So some of the first native um, fruits to ripen are ones that have to be sown immediately. So the red elderberry, which is not the edible one for people, it's edible for birds, but it's, I think it's even considered poisonous for people. Those, those and the um, little, Lonicera canadensis, the fly honeysuckle, those are some of the first two shrub fruits and amelanchier that ripen. And, you know, all these, well, some of them you can, well, the Lonicera is not edible. What I do is put them in, as, um, in a bag and mush them, smush them. You have to pretend you're a bird's stomach, basically. You know, these are all designed to go through the digestive crap, digestive tract of a bird or mammal. And so you need to often ferment them for a week or so, and then you can rinse them, you know, either in a, you know, cup of water and then sow the seeds immediately. Don't let them dry out. The other great edible that everybody should have in their yard is the American hazelnut. And those, when they ripen in August, you know they're ripe because within 30 seconds, the chipmunks and squirrels have determined that and will get them all. So you really got to be prepared to get them quickly and remove them from their husk. And um, I, I tend to put them in, either in a Ziploc bag or a jar and wait and put them in the refrigerator and then wait and sew them later in the fall once I have a rodent proof container. They're one um, you just can't plant without having a wire cage around them because they'll be found really quickly by the rodents. Um, the different um, native plums like beach plum, that's a really great one that you can clean it yourself by popping it in your mouth and spitting the seed out. If you cook them up, you know, like to make jam, then the seed's going to be no good. You will have killed it by the heat. Um, so, but you can just um, wild grapes the same way too. Just, you know, after you eat the fruit, spit the seeds out, but, um, and then be prepared to sow them. But typically with many of the species, not all, that seed, you know, doesn't want to be dry, 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 dry. Um, like, um, Winterberry holly, all the ilex species, those have to be sown fresh. They will, you'll kill them if they dry out. Same with the viburnums, most of the viburnums and dog, dogwoods. Interestingly, even though the dogwoods are like a favorite bird food, those fruits smell terrible. Um, and they're weird. I guess it's what's so good about them. They're kind of oily, um, but man, when those are fermenting, they are not a pleasant experience. Um, I'll add, I'll add just a couple things. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we found out works pretty well, if you're trying to get fruits both to eat or to, um, grow for seed, um, is using like a paint strainer bag on the end of the plant where the fruit's ripening. Um, and that way you have more access. There's some shrubs that either the fruit ripens and it drops off and it's gone. And then there's shrubs that you're going to be fighting birds and squirrels and stuff for. And it seems like things like a paint streamer bag or a little like knickknack bag, water still has to get through and sun still has to get through. Um, if you tie it to those little ripening fruits, you can kind of rescue some of some of them. They, they sell things that are specifically for that and like the grape industry, um, probably a little more expensive than buying something online. Um, yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you both so much. Um, so for those of you, there are so many questions that you've sent in um, and I really appreciate that. Um, for, for all of you, what we'll be doing is um, we won't lose these questions. And as we um, go through the season, we will try and make sure we collate them uh, and provide you all with answers. They're great reminders for how we can support the information that we've got in the shrub guide to begin with. Um, before I uh, just go to a brief close, I wanna um, end with the two of you asking my quick question, which is, 
what is your native shrub crush right now? Which is your favorite thing that you're excited to put in the ground? I really love New Jersey tea. I think that's the Cianothus americanus. That's a not very well known drought tolerant. It's small and neat. You know, it makes a nice little mound. I guess that's one that um, I would, and the pollen, the insects love it in the summer. It's not common in New England anymore, mm. um, but it's not hard. It's easy to propagate. Um, love to see more of that out in the world. Great. That's what good. about you, Emily? Oh, it's always hard to choose. I usually say mountain laurel. It's always just been one of my my favorites. It's got really cool um, pollination technique. If you if you get just the chance to watch it while it's flowering and watch how the bees pollinate it, it's it's really unique um, and neat. They've got these little cup shaped flowers. The anthers sit along the bases of them, held down, so that when the the bees they have to be heavy enough land on that flower the anthers pop up and wrap around the back of the bee and the bee has to push off up through those anthers and it gets the pollen all over the back of the, the furry little bees. And it's just really neat to watch them go. Um, but I'll add one more is spicefish just because I just planted it in my yard. It came with my Fedco order. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned this before, every time I, I order shrubs specifically, um, other things too, I order at least three of them. Um, Cause if you're just doing one and putting it in, it's not really gonna do enough. I usually do like between three and seven or eight, uh -huh. but Spicebush supports the Spicebush caterpillar and they're just one of the coolest little caterpillars. Um, I say little, they get kind of big, but they'll wrap the Spicebush leaf around themselves to feed in it. And it's so cool because when you look inside, they've got these false eye spots and it just looks like a little snake sleeping in a, a sleeping bag or something. Uh, and they're just so neat. They're also, they also produce an inedible fruit that's kind of got a fun spice to it. But like I said before, I plant for caterpillars. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you both so much. I'm just uh, sharing out my screen right now. I'd encourage any of you who are um, in the chat, uh, do share your native plant crush or native shrub crush uh, with the rest of folks who are here. And um, we are just gonna close out with a reminder that if you go to our website, uh, our new guide, Native Shrubs for Northeast Landscapes, is available for sale. Um, we are shipping them as fast as we can. Um, and if you want to complete the collection, you can also uh, get our guides on native ground covers and native trees to get all different layers of the landscape. Um, and for those of you who aren't currently members, I would like to encourage you to join us as members. We do question and answer sessions like this on broad topics every month. Um, and and it's exclusive for members. And also every year you get a copy of our newest guide. Um, so please do join us, uh, join this movement. We're so glad to have you with us uh, learning and being passionate about native plants. Um, thanks so much, everyone. And we'll see you again real soon.